All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back from lunch. Perfect. I am. Uh, I hope you have, I, I. I really enjoyed lunch. It was really good today. I had the vegetarian. It was. It was fantastic. I don't know if you tried it. It was really good. Hello, world. Everybody online. We have um, lots and lots of people watching us online as well. So uh, welcome back. Now we are going to continue with the discussion that we started this morning as well on trust. And can we trust the new things that we are all developing? And to our help, we will uh, have Anthony, Professor Anthony Turner, uh, that will lead the, the discussion with, with the panel. He will introduce the panel himself. But I just have to say um, thank you to uh, Anthony for helping out with the advisory committee as well. And, and I know that a big, um, they appreciate that very much. So thank you very much for helping out with everything here. And also, um, as it says online, Professor Turner's name is synonymous with the field of biosensors. Uh, and he is very, very well known in that field. With over 750 publications and, and a large number of patents, I think I said nobody, not many people know it better than Anthony. So, Anthony, please, <laughs> the stage is yours and the panel is yours. And I'll be joining the cage and hopefully to give you some... Thank you. Interesting question. And I'll, I'll catch you <laughs> later on from the cage if we manage to fit it in, which I hope we will. So thank you very much. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here. I've, uh, you can see that I have an academic background. And the reason for bringing me in was to try to get a little more scientific rigor into some of these analysis of these exciting new uh, products that we've, uh, we've got around. And so the panel is assembled very much from the perspective of trying to probe the detail and understand the reliability issues of all these exciting possibilities. I mean, we've seen here what I might uh, call personalities on steroids and products that are going to change the world in every possible way. Um, but uh, really, how much can people and patients rely on these instruments and how sustainable are they into the future? Is it just all uh, a big hype and a new product and a new brand or is there something really uh, underlying uh, this area? So I'm, I'm in here from a research and development perspective, spent 35 years developing uh, biosensors, but also I've done a lot of due diligence, a lot of expert witness work, uh, and I'm interested in seeing things as not just apps, but whole instruments and infrastructure to support them. And we've had, we put together uh, this program with the Scientific Advisory Committee, and I'd like to thank them here, Florence Hasseltine, uh, Joram Peterson, uh, Monica Lidin, Pierre Olaf, uh, Head of Quist, Niels Christa Pearson, and Uno Fors, all helped thinking about this and putting these themes together that we're going to try and address today. And we identified five uh, core themes to get us started. We'll see where we go with this. Um, and and uh, the themes were uh, integrated data, guaranteeing the source and quality of data. Uh, the idea of next generation wearables, which are incorporating more than just the physical or patient input data, but also biochemical data and areas such as genetic tests. The value and relevance of these uh, instruments and uh, this field uh, to people and how to engage people and how to engage patients uh, in uh, the devices. And the proof of efficacy. Uh, do we get real value for users from these new digital health products? And finally, uh, as a passing thought, really, at the, or a, a final summing thought at the end, is it all hype or not? Do we have really sustainable products for the future that are going to uh, survive the bubble and give us real value and realize the great potential and promise that we're all very excited about. So that's what we're going to try and do in the next, uh, uh, where's my timer here, somewhere. Uh, anyway, I guess about 55 minutes left. Oh, I found the timer. Uh, and uh, we'll run with this panel. The format, um, I'm going to ask each of the panel members uh, to give us a five-minute uh, presentation outlining 
their, briefly themselves, although I'll introduce them, their perspective and their companies and their interests. And then we're going to run the, rest, the whole of the rest of the session as a panel discussion um, and uh, see where that takes us addressing some of these very uh, important issues. So uh, I'll move then uh, to our first uh, panel member, um, uh, Rail uh, Sherevitzel, uh, who co-founded, please co come on up, Rail, uh, co-founded Natural Cycles AB uh, three years ago, uh, and as CEO has grown the company to be of significant influence here in Sweden. Uh, and uh, he's a PhD physicist from ETH and uh, Bern in Switzerland. And you told me your dream was to make a discovery from which you could build a company and uh, I think you'll tell us about some of the ups and downs of that dream uh, in your introduction so over to Rail first. Yeah, thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation to this interesting conference. I was here actually two years ago that was about the same time when we started Natural Cycles we had no users um, or very little users and we just started and now I'm here two years later with yeah, 100,000 users in 160 countries worldwide so we we grew a lot, uh, and um, yeah, thank you. But uh, so originally, I, as as he mentioned, I'm a physicist. I was um, I went into physics because I wanted to make a discovery that I could turn into a business later on. So that was always my dream to to to, to start a company based on on, on a scientific discovery. Um, it turned out that my research was very interesting, but uh, it was far away from any application. I was moving atoms around, um, putting them next to each other, and that that led to a whole new phenomena. But it it was very far from any application because for once they, some of them were radioactive and then they only worked when it was really, really cold, like space temperatures. And, and uh, so it was, um, and I felt like, you know, like I, I, you know, I don't want to spend my next 50 years trying to bring this to the market. I would like to bring something to the market now. And um, at the same time, uh, my wife, she was my girlfriend at that time, I think, um, she was also a physicist, um, particle physics at CERN. Um, uh, part of the Higgs boson discovery that led to the Nobel Prize, so she actually, uh, her research actually led to a Nobel Prize as well. Um, she um, she stopped hormonal contraception, and uh, because she had family history and so on, and and uh, and we started looking into natural family planning, and uh, and we were surprised that there was very little out there actually. You know, like it's a, it's a, when you speak to doctors, it's frowned upon, so no, stay away from that. Uh, and also, like the common knowledge around it is that either people don't know that it exists, or if they know about it exists, it means that it's it's not effective. So we read up on the literature, and it's hundred years old, right? So it's not innovative in that sense. And then we discovered some device out there that, based on the temperature, it, re it, it gives back a red or a green light depending on there's a risk of pregnancy or not. So we bought that, and then we quickly thought, man, this algorithm we can do it much better with our, our mathematical skills. So we so we did that, and then uh, we quickly our colleagues started emailing us their temperatures and we s ran the algorithm on certain servers and sent it back to them whether it was red or green and realized that this is actually that something that women really need uh, and uh, and there should be something out there that is uh, effective, uh, well tested and that people can rely on for preventing pregnancies but also planning pregnancies. So that was kind of the start of Natural Cycles. And as I mentioned, we started two years ago to actively market this product. Uh, we grew uh, phenomenally fast here in Sweden. So I, I without, uh, like, I'm trying to stay humble, but I think every woman between 20 and 35 in Sweden knows about us here. So, and, and now we are also, like, working toward expanding into other countries. And uh, we have performed uh, two clinical studies, one that tested the accuracy at finding ovulation, the other one at how effective it is for contraception. And there the results were comparable to the contraceptive pill, so very promising. And now we're coming out with a third clinical study that analyzes how, f how fast, it, how long it takes to get pregnant and, and what factors affect the time to pregnancy, you know, like uh, obviously age, BMI, height, things like this. And uh, so this is coming out hopefully in the winter now. It's um, about to be submitted. So, and um, yeah, we also had our, our fair, um, we grew very fast, we became very high profile and we also had our um, encounter with regulators that then one year ago actually said, you know, you have to stop marketing yourself as a contraceptive. And, and that was, a, and since then we've been working on resolving this because we, we strongly believe that this is a product that, uh, that women need and the, the women that use a product, they really love a product. Um, they're really grateful that something, an option like this exists. And uh, so we want to bring it back onto the market as a contraceptive. 
and uh, and we have since then worked for that. And I don't know if we will cover more of that, um, so uh, we can speak about that later. But it's uh, it is part of it's part for me. It's um, I'm, I'm I'm not too worried about because. For me, it's part of uh, bringing a, a new product onto the market, and uh, important is that you know it's something that people need and want, and then the rest uh, will work itself out. As long as you know that what you're providing is good, this thing should be on the market. Thank you. Thank you. Marvelous. So if I can have the mic back. Uh, yes. So thank you very much. Well, we, as you say, we'll come back to some of the issues that you were beginning to raise at the end there um, as we move into the panel discussion. But next, I'd like to introduce Stefan. Uh, and uh, uh, Stefan Boriasson uh, is co-founder and CEO of Selfit AB. And he's fused the power of genetic analysis, specifically SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms, with psychological input to personalized genetic analysis. And his vision is to use technology to point people in the right direction, which is another issue we'll pick up later, uh, and to understand our very different individual needs. So, Stefan. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Stefan Bergson, CEO and co-founder of Selfit. Getting in shape and being in shape has become, well, it's one of the biggest trends in society right now. Being in shape has become a status symbol. Being in shape is the new black. But it's hard to get in shape. I think everyone who has tried, succeeded or failed would agree that it's hard to get in shape. It's hard to choose between the hundreds of different diets and training programs screaming at you from TV sets and laptops and iPads every day telling you to eat more of that, less of that, run more, swim, jump, go to aerobics. What we are doing is that we're making this a lot more personal. We're trying to find out and help you decide what really works for you. So by looking at features you were born with, nature, your DNA, and then also looking at who you are today, nurture, your personality, your behavior, and by combining these two, we can come up with very good advice to sort of nudge people in the right direction. We're not going to tell people eat 1,600 calories less per day or run this many miles or do this many push-ups, but we will guide people in the right direction based on who they really are. Science in this area is moving forward very quickly and uh, coming back to discussion later on, we have to tread carefully because there are quite a lot of products and quite a lot of information out there. And I think our biggest challenge would be to consumerize scientific language, so to speak, because that's one of the biggest problems is that when you come from a scientific background, which I don't, but if you do, how do you translate science into a language that consumers would understand? We're a small company, we just started. There are three of us, only me here today, unfortunately. Uh, as I said, I'm not a scientist. I went to business school, God forbid. Uh, I have about 20 years of experience in consumer durables. The last couple of years I've worked in the sports industry, so I have seen how much time, money and effort people are willing to spend to get in better shape. You could say, I'm the one who knows the consumer. We got Dr. Sami Amin, who's our CTIO. You could say he's a very entrepreneurial molecular biologist. Try to say that five times quickly, if you can. Uh, he's, behind, he's the scientist in the team. He will make sure that our product has a strong, sound, solid base in proven science. And then when we get a little bit further, we're not quite there yet, we have Mr. Vasilis Kaliotos, who is our CTO. He will make sure that we 
walk in a relatively straight line towards our goal, which of course is that everyone who wants to get in shape can get in shape. Looking at monitoring versus prevention, uh, my answer is quite simple. I would say in most cases, a bit of both. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. So now I'd like to uh, turn to Professor Leslie Pendrel, uh, heralds from the uh, Oxford Physics Department originally, but a long-term uh, resident in Sweden, is our specialist in metrology and was, is with uh, STP, uh, SP Technical Research Institute of Sweden in Boreas. And his focus is on quality-assured measurement in order to ensure patient safety, comparability, and interoperability. So, Leslie. Thank you, you, Tony. And thank you also to the organization for inviting me to participate this afternoon. Uh, there was a comment made this morning, digital health. It's a very young discipline. Uh, and then one of the speakers came up, and he had been working 10 years in the field. So it's a very old thing. I'm going to be talking on a different time. Uh, we have a long legacy uh, in our field of metrology. Uh, I'd just like to explain what metrology is and what the relevance is, I think, for digital health. Uh, I come from an institute, SP, which is this country's largest civil research institute. Uh, this 1st January, the turn of the year coming here, we're going to merge together with many of the other institutes you know, like Swedish ICT and Inventia, into one institute called RISE. So that's the name to remember for the future. And part of RISE organization is a, what we call a National Metrology Institute, Riksmetplatz in Swedish. And what is that? That means we have a task of maintaining national standards for different measurement quantities. So what you can see here is the Swedish meter, uh, the laser system there. And I'm talking about a long time perspective. The meter, the bar there, is coming from the 19th century. Now you might say, what applications are we talking about? In the 19th century, it was trade, international trade. 20th century, manufacturing industry. 21st century, digital health. So you can't see from the standards themselves what applications they are. They're purely generic, but some of the interest is in the specificities of digital health. Before I get to that, just what is metrology? It's not the weather, it's quality assured a measurement. What everyone measures, everyone in this room measures all the time. So what's the special thing that we're doing that you don't do? We assure the quality of our measurement results. Okay, what does that mean? It means two things. Firstly, that our measurements are traceable to these standards you saw. And that means you can compare objectively our measurement results with measurement results made by other people at other, other times. So that's one aspect. The second aspect of quality assured measurement is that we openly declare our uncertainties. We're not perfect, and we put a number on them as well. So there's a typical familiar length measuring result. There you see a traceable result, plus or minus an uncertainty. And you say, great, but what's that good for? Well, it turns out if you measure any product, any process with quality assured measurement, then that product or process will itself acquire the quality of the measurement. So you'll get products and processes which are intercomparable that can work together. And now we're getting close to digital health then. So digital health has two components, the digital part and the health part. So we're interested at SP in developing quality assured measurement for the digital part, so measuring the performance of digital systems, and also quality assured measurement in health and making those uh, results reliable. And this is something, of course, that's of concern for modern healthcare, digital health, but also in more general. Here we have a picture from Social Stiosa. We're talking about a common information structure, an infrastructure to support the quality and reliability of measurements done, for example, in the health service. Of course, patient safety, the correct decisions on health made by the doctor and clinician are very key in any health situation. 
We have to ensure the comparability of measurements and decisions made in healthcare, and we have to make sure that our digital health systems are interoperable with each other. All those things rely on having access to quality assured measurement. Here's I just took an example. I'm not a representative of Dexcom, but I thought they had a very nice slide there showing this diabetic, uh, one of our uh, diabetics in the cage there. He had a, this tattoo. This is a similar thing. Wonderful lot of data, but can I really trust that data? I don't know. On those smartphones there, I can't see the measurement uncertainty. They're nice plots, but what's the quality of that data? No idea. So I'd recommend you put on these measurement uncertainties so we can actually know the limitations. I'm soon finished here. So now we're going to debate monitoring prevention in relation to well-being. And I sort of sat about thinking about this title and where our measurement comes in. It comes in in three different stages, as far as I could see. Talking about monitoring, then it's a kind of perspective in the past. We're making reliable measurements, hopefully, over a period of time, monitoring the state of the person, either objectively or more subjective measurements. Then we have the present, which is our present level of well-being. We have to measure that. And then prevention is what's going to happen in the future. So the challenges here are to have a reliable infrastructure of measurement which leads us through this whole time scale from the past into the future. And the particular challenges, I think, in the health area are two. Firstly, apart from these objective measurements of various quantities, there's a certain subjective aspect to making measurements with people. So we're looking very much about new methods to qualish your subjective measurements. And the, th the, th the um, other thing is the very strong variability in the human being. Human being is not like a, an instrument. It really does scatter a lot. So we're looking also at new methods to take care of this large scatter. So that's just some of the things that I have in my mind while we're going to have our panel discussion. So thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, Leslie. Thank you. And then last but not least, I'd like to introduce Joel uh, Bocas. Um, and uh, he's with Salutem Digital Health, which operates internationally out of the UK. And he comes with a substantial pedigree in professional sports and works at the intersection of technology and business models in shaping co consumer behavior. And his impact is, the in, is uh, his interest is in the impact of disruptive innovations on future trends in the marketplace. So, sure. Fantastic. Thanks, Anthony, for that uh, introduction. My name is Joe Bocas, and I've been working in uh, global digital health innovation for the past 10 years. My background is actually in professional sports. I was a professional a football coach and a fitness trainer for a number of years. And I really have an interest in health and well-being in general from a professional perspective, but also a personal perspective. And I'm based in UK, in, outside the, in London, just outside London, to be precise, in Brighton. I don't know many of you know that uh, wonderful place. Yeah. And I'm delighted to be here amongst the true international digital health uh, community. I'm actually very happy to be here because I nearly lost my flight, missed my flight last night. Oh. <laughs> so the flight was delayed 40 minutes, so I actually made it. I was doing other presentation. But um, I found a digital solutum, and very quickly what we do, we represent and support innovative digital health uh, companies to enter different markets, primarily UK and Europe. And we specialize in digital health wearable technologies, big data, and uh, we are very interested, of course, in the disruption of healthcare in the Nordics, and we have other insights from other markets too. So that's about it. Thank you so much. Thank you. So you see, we have, uh, we have a wonderful panel uh, with very diverse but uh, relevant uh, experience, and I hope we can address a number of issues now uh, and uh, try to pin down at least some of the basis for reliability in digital health and digital health products. And I wanted to 
kick off. Um, and I'll uh, perhaps uh, warn you, it's going to be rail first, I think, that uh, I'd like to direct this question to initially, but then please, all of you, feel free to, to chip in. And I want to pick up something that you said right at the, uh, at the end of your, your presentation about the, the regulators. And uh, I wanted to explore the uh, problems associated with digital health. I mean, have we got here a, a catch-22? Have we got regulation that is, well, perhaps putting it very poignantly, not fit for purpose? Or is it fit for a purpose that is an old purpose but not the new purpose? In other words, how do we, is, is the regulation appropriate? And how should we regulate these products, uh, these new products, in order to give the uh, users and, and, in the health case, the patient the confidence that this is a reliable device? But perhaps you could share some of your experience with the regulators to begin with, Rail. Yeah. I mean, um, I think the, the regulations um, make a lot of sense. And they're, they're basically based on common sense, right? You're supposed to bring a product onto the market that is that is um, s safe for the users to use and effective or delivers uh, its purpose. And, and in our case, the thing is that we have this, this app that kind of has the same intended use as a drug or, or a condom in, in our case, right? Like people quit the pill, start using natural cycles for the same purpose. And uh, the, the regulatory f framework um, was simply not written for, th they didn't anticipate that information could have a similar impact. On, uh, on the human body as, as a drug, for instance, and, or, 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 yeah, or a medical device. So, um, so I would say that the, the, in our case, the, the, the initial problem was like that, you know, it's very, they're very def well-defined boxes in the regulatory framework where your product is supposed to be in, which risk category and so on. And in our case, when, when we started, we, th we went to the regulators and asked them for their opinion, and then they said, we should go talk to these notified bodies, these auditors. And we said, look, we are contraceptive. Please audit us against that. And they said, no, you, you're an information tool that tells when to use contraception, like condoms on these fertile days. Uh, so you're not a contraceptive. So we said then, but, um, and, and, some, and we talked then to another notified body and another one. And some said, no, you're not even a medical device. You're just, a, you're just an app. <laughs> you don't touch the body. You don't do nothing. And, uh, and then eventually we managed to convince that, okay, one notified body that we are a medical device. Uh, but that we are this uh, fertility monitor, not a contraceptive device. So we became that, and then when the regulator stepped in one year ago, they said, uh, you guys should be a contraceptive device, you are not, uh, remove yourself from the market. Mm -hmm. And that's when the whole discussion started. I got a very expensive education on regulatory affairs, mm -hmm. I can tell you that, the last year. And, uh, and, we be and, 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 and that was one aspect of things that, you know, the, the regulatory framework is just simply not, uh, ha did not anticipate, and I think it needs to adapt a little bit um, I don't think overall, you know, the, the things are the same, right? You have a, you document everything that you do, you have processes in place, and all this we do anyways already. So it's, and it needs to update. Some things are impossible to comply with, like um, for our device, you're supposed to send a manual in paper to every user that uses it, and we're an app that do gets downloaded from the app store, and we don't have the addresses, so we cannot do that, for instance. So that needs to change, for instance. But then, so overall, that, that's, that's one aspect. And the other thing is also the clinical data, right? Everything is based on the clinical data. And, um, and that's also a new approach, right? We have all these uh, women using our product in real life, and uh, we can, from the distance, basically perform clinical studies on how the product is actually used in real life, which is even written in the regulation. That's the most valuable sort of data, right? And, uh, and um, while generally when you want to bring a product onto the market, you have to go through like phase one, phase two, phase three, mm -hmm. and then bring it onto the market and so on. So, and that's, that's also different with a digital product, right? So the way you accumulate data, you can accumulate data much faster um, and um, at a different cost. And in the end, you know, like you, you're talking about the catch-22 problem. It is a little bit like that because, you know, like if we want to be able to be used as a contraceptive, we need to show data that people have used it for contraception and it's okay. And uh, in order to get that, you need to have users using it. Uh, in order to have users, you need to kind of get the users somehow, so you need money. And uh, so you can go either to life science investor, but they don't invest in products like ours because they say, like, guys, you're an app, you're not a molecule, um, it's, not, uh, it's not innovative. Um, and then you go to the tech investors and say, yeah, well, we're not going to give you $50 million to do one clinical trial <laughs> and maybe get accepted before you get any users saying, like, is this product even, do pe women even want this product? So they give you money to, to get users, basically. And uh, 
so in our case, we, we, we got users and we also perform clinical studies as we grow along. And, uh, and that's, that's also a new approach to, to the regulatory framework, which would bring uh, products to the market at lower cost, I think. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a, an issue that many of us face with, uh, with these new products and uh, trying to get, especially if we're in the health space, yeah. you know, how do we get this approved? But maybe as, uh, I'd like to uh, move along. I mean, maybe, Leslie, I mm -hmm. mean, is some, something of your field, would you like to add anything right. to that? Right. Um, I'd like to draw just a parallel with uh, another area which was very much hyped uh, 20 years ago, uh, nanotechnology. Mm some similarities in the dy dynamic aspects of, of the field. Um, a lot of startups were wanted to get in, make business a lot of money out of uh, nanotechnology in a short period of time. But as we saw yesterday morning, this exponential curve that we're shown there is, yeah. is something yeah. that we have to think in mind. So it's never too early to sit around the table together with decision makers to get a consensus about terminology, for example, so you don't, understand, don't misunderstand each other. Yeah. So what we did in nanotechnology was quite early on to do what we call pre-normative mm. activities. So ahead of standardization, get industry and academics together and start to draft the standards of the future and the standards are then support for the regulators later on. Mm. So I would imagine that the digital health sector would have a similar pre-normative stage. And it's something that sort of institution can, can drive. I yes. mean, it's difficult, tough for a three-person startup to uh, Yes, to but this. at the same time, the, the participation of small startups is essential uh, to get the right ingredients. Joel, I mean, you're in the business of internationalization of mm -hmm. uh, these digital health and so on. What's your perspective on, yeah, on well, this? Regulation is cer certainly a, a challenge, uh, uh, and I really empathize with that. I see it many times as a medical device, is not. Mm -hmm. and, um, but that shouldn't stop uh, people to uh, persevere and, and come up with a, with a great product. And yeah. it seems like Royal done that uh, very well with natural cycles. Mm -hmm. But in terms of internationalization, there are many factors to to consider, especially when, when going to different markets. I, I would say strategically from a business point of view, and that's where I see many startups filing, is um, they go for a bigger market that perhaps seems very attractive, but is not the right market for them. Uh, and I see many mistakes being made in that sense. And also try to push the, the, the product or the solution straight into the market, which um, sometimes is not the right approach too, because you might be better off finding a, a bigger partner in that market that could give you market access and perhaps your internationalization penetration, if you like, mm. would be much uh, faster and smoother and uh, more successful in the end. Mm. So there are many things I could talk about internalization all, all day long yeah. because I see it on a daily basis. Yeah. I'm not going to, yeah. but there are many things to, to consider. Mm -hmm. I would finish on one, la one last point. I think from a startup and a new business uh, point of view and the Royal gain that traction, mm -hmm. gaining that traction is really, really important. Mm -hmm. That will determine mm -hmm. the success of the product or not. So. And Stefan Selfit has some very particular challenges here with a combination of the science of the DNA and genetic analysis with the psychological analysis that you're, you're looking at. How are you approaching these issues? Well, luckily enough, we haven't come that far yet. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't run into any regulatory yeah. obstacles as such as, as you've already gone through. But I think Raoul mentioned something very, very important, and that is definitions. And I think if the regulating bodies don't keep up with new technology, new, new products, new consumer behaviors, and so on, there is a risk that those of us who are starting new companies, developing new products, instead of following regulations, we simply redefine what it is we're selling. So it doesn't fit into the regulatory environment, as you said. I mean, if you're not a contraceptive, you're just an app then you can basically do what you want. It's, it's not the right thing to do, but no. I think more and more people will do it because 
you look at dieting, it's perfectly safe to say that kale is good for you. But as soon as you start talking about health or something developed in a lab, then you're covered by regulations. So, yeah, I think it's really important that regulations keep up with modern technology. Once I've got you on, on the microphone, um, I mean, changing subject a little bit, but uh, you're, you're very much involved with um, in data inputted by the individual. Um, so, I mean, we've got this... Uh, tradition of standardization and, under, and understanding the value of data that is objectively obtained in, uh, by scientific measurement. But then you're inputting patient inputted data or person inputted data or user inputted data. H how is that uh, introducing unreliability or is it actually introducing much greater relevance and a much better usability? Uh, uh, why don't we just stick with the standard validated scientific measurement uh, and to, to get what we need from uh, your sort of area? Well, that, that's not going to bring us forward, is it? So I, I think uh, consumer-generated data, in, in our case, which is just a part of it because it's a psychological assessment, and of course that yeah. depends on... It could depend on your daily mood or certain current events and so on and so on. But I think the combination with that and traditional scientific data, as you said, in our case, DNA, then I think the combination will drive us forward. I think you cannot put too much trust into one type of data only. Mm -hmm. And I guess psychological analysis is not uh, an, an unknown quantity. Uh, no, it's not. It, it's, uh, there's plenty of use of that in products and, and, and well, in science as well as in products. So yeah. Would anybody else like to pick, pick that one up? Or yeah, I, yeah, I could take on from that. Yeah. Um, this is something actually we're doing a lot of research on at the present time. Um, if we think about healthcare, then one of the main paradigm changes in the recent years is the focus on person-centered care. And that doesn't mean personalized medicine, that's something else. But so person-centered care really means putting the patient at the center of his own care. Yeah. Um, so the patient becomes a, an important source of information for his own treatment. Yeah, yeah. So it's not just the doctor prescribing. Yeah. Um, and this fits very well with the digital health revolution as well because uh, the patient himself has access to all the sensors and yeah. the apps. Um, so we're interested in assuring the quality of measurements from a human being, mm, mm. putting numbers on those. And... Um, about 10 years ago, we had an EU network called Measuring the Impossible because it was co <laughs> considered impossible to make measurements with human beings. We were so unreliable as measurement instruments. Mm. But we got together with uh, sociologists and psychologists and engineers and physicists like myself and have now developed models of the human being as a measurement instrument. Mm. Mm. Very interesting. Uh, and this is a key part of assuring the quality of measurements done by many of the digital health systems yes. that we're looking at here. Yes, and, and so it just becomes a very valuable additional source of information, I guess, and that's the it's theme. A it's another dimension, it's an important right. dimension, and it's expanding both relevance but also basic scientific information. It's well, I, I could give you a, ca a case study. Uh, day one yesterday, there were several speakers talking about diabetes. Yeah. Now, the... Uh, in the beginning of, the, of this century, there was a study in northern Sweden called Björknes, uh, a three-year intervention experiment where you got diabetics to eat better and exercise more. Mm. And we had a control group as well. Um, and we did measurements. I didn't do the measurements myself, but the, the Björknes study, as it's called, did measurements of the various blood value patterns. Mm. And after 36 months, we put the curves together with their measurement uncertainties. And what did you see? Not much. <laughs> there was barely, barely any difference between the control group and the intervention group. Mm. If anything, the control group was getting better health mm. after those six months. Mm. So what's the problem? Well, in addition to these classical clinical measures of blood, soccer, and so forth, one needs extra indicators. Mm. Mm. And we're looking into those indicators now related to, which are more sensitive perhaps in terms of the performance of everyday activities yeah. related to a diabetic.
So I think, I mean, generally now we're looking to put a lot more data in, I mean, get a lot more measurement, get measurement, patient inputted or user inputted data, extra scientific data, and perhaps moving away from the easy stuff. I mean, we've yeah. had some very nice, elegant lectures showing that there's a lot of stuff in a mobile phone that you can utilize. But at the moment, if you like, that's the low hanging fruit. Yes. I mean, there's a lot of information we would like to measure that we don't have the right uh, tools right. To, to, to get at. Perhaps a bit like your physics in ETH, you know, that it's, uh, it's a lifetime away from getting there. But there's perhaps some things in between yeah. uh, where we can bring more measurement science in and more, yeah. more uh, measurement technology and really get the uh, breadth of data that's going and to be Things are moving fast, data. like in the digital health. So we now have tools available. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's a living laboratory as well, of course, Absolutely. generating in, uh, information as well. I think, I think user-generated data is super interesting because uh, it really reflects how people in the end behave in real life. I'm thinking about my field now of contraception, yes. right? In, yes. in a classical trial, you have a, a nurse that calls every other day. Did you take the pill? Did you yes. take the pill? That, of course, you know, increases compliance and improves the results in the end. Mm -hmm. and, but it's also interesting to know, and we see now, that actually people then that use it in real life, they forget to take the pill because they don't get a, local, uh, a daily reminder from the nurse to take mm. it, right? So, <laughs> and, and so therefore, it's, in our case, the study runs you know, in real life. So when we see women using and some get pregnant, and then we can see that you know, this is how uh, Swedish women uh, use, um, this is how Swedish women um, you know, react to this product. This is how well it works in Sweden. And we do actually the same study now in Germany and the US with different users, and we do see differences, right? The Germans are better at complying. That's a, <laughs> a stereotype <laughs> reinforced, but yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and so on. So I think there's, there's huge value, but I think the researchers that analyze this data, they, just, yeah. they simply have to know about the limitations too, because you, you know, the, not everyone always enters data every day, right? So the quality of the data set is worse than if it's really controlled. So it's a, and that's, I mean, the researchers have to deal with that, but that's, that's really doable. I guess, Stefan, I mean, are you making use of the patient input data here and, and expanding on, upon that database? Yeah, to, to a certain extent, yes. But also we have to keep in mind that the, the decision-making power is moving more and more towards the consumer. The more information that becomes available, information about yourself, but also general information about health and, and wellness, the more informed you get, and you make the decision in the end. So you also, it's not only the data itself, it's mm. where it comes from. Yeah. Uh, so you tend to trust data that yourself <laughs> generated, yeah, of course, yeah, because yeah, we believe that we know ourselves yeah. really well, but that's not always the case. So it's mm. a little bit about whom do you trust. Yeah, yeah. So, and it's also perhaps not so much the device telling you, but you uh, interacting with the device and using it as a, a tool and an educational tool rather than than an instruction or a, uh, something that's just going to give you the answer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, I didn't know, do you want to comment or shall I move to another subject? You can move to another yeah, subject. Yeah, I, I was actually want. going to turn to you, Joel, and, and, and uh, talk about, you, you have this huge experience of looking at many companies in this space in, in, in digital health. Um, and we had something of a, a bubble, if you like, or a, a, a peak in interest. You mentioned nanotechnology, which, you know, the patents mm. all shot up and then reality started uh, uh, appearing. Um, in digital health, I, I, what I want to get to is what's, going, what's the key to sustainability here? Uh, how, how are we going to get a, a steady uh, output of really useful products that, that mean something to the users that are, are not just... Um, uh, a pie in the sky, one shot sort of uh, excitement about uh, some new fashion. How do we get beyond fashion and get real sustainability into this business? Interest the interesting uh, subject on data. I was thinking when uh, the other members were commentating, I was thinking about biosensors and new trends that are just coming in now and uh, some revolutions that will touch healthcare, such as yeah. artificial, artificial intelligence Absolutely. and augmented yeah. reality. We're going back to your, um, to your question. If we talk about wearables, for example, mm -hmm. they're great. I love them and I see them. And now I believe we are entering a new generation of wearables because five years ago when Fitbit released their first mm -hmm. fitness tracker, tracking steps was a big deal. <laughs> but now for me as a consumer, tracking steps is not a big deal anymore. Mm. And uh, the consumer is demanding more. 
and if you offer me just tracking steps, it's not an interesting proposition anymore. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing these new trends, but there are uh, fundamental issues that the, if we talk about wearables, the wearables companies haven't been able to crack yet, such as the long-term engagement, which is that sort of sustainability that will make a long, medium-term impact. So the wearables are great. There are many studies now that um, defend that about 50% of people drop out in the first three months mm -hmm. because or they run out of battery or you forgot them or you're not purely interested anymore. So there is a, really a gap there mm -hmm. in fulfilling that piece of the jigsaw. How are they going to keep people engaged mm -hmm. and interested? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I bought a wearable in the first place because I thought it would be relevant for me as a consumer, I'm just thinking mm -hmm. about as a consumer uh, uh, perspective in here. But then what's going to keep me going? Mm -hmm. So the wearable on its own is not uh, the miracle. Yeah. And, and we, we talk about that and I talk to many customers and, mm -hmm. and, and, and other colleagues about this. Uh, there is this expectation and they're not going to do the trick mm -hmm. because the miracle lies in the human being. <laughs> the human being mm -hmm. is in charge of the wheel of the car. The car on his own, I'm afraid, not yet, yeah. is not going to drive you anywhere. Yeah. You still have to drive yeah. the car. So uh, the same principle, I believe, applies to the wearables. We have to find the engagement that is actually uh, keep us going and interested, motivated to keep using it, and, and extracting different pieces of data, because uh, I believe in, in terms of motivation, something new is important. But uh, to finish you off, a new generation of wearables are presenting themselves. I was thinking about biosensors, and uh, I've seen a company very innovative from America now. They, they have a wearable uh, with a biosensor that reads the body uh, chemistry mm. and is ongoing monitoring mm. for many long-term conditions. Yeah, yeah. And that's very, very interesting. So yeah. we well move ahead from the tracking steps yeah. just, if you like. So a lot of new input coming in, but... Uh, and products that are really worth something in the future. But maybe I'll turn to the cage for a moment. Uh, hi over there. I know there's some, uh, some friends uh, uh, thinking about and following the, 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 the talk here. I mean, another thing as well is, is trust, surely, in these devices, that um, you know, if, you, if you're going to start influencing your life uh, with these uh, uh, wearables and these, these, uh, the, these devices, You've got to believe in them and be confident in them. But uh, do you have a comment uh, or a question for the panel uh, from the cage there? We have a few questions. I don't know how much time we have. Um, <laughs> it was a great, great session. I know, Bastian, you actually used the technology that yeah. Leslie was uh, describing. And we have Donnie in the cage for the first time. So um, I think I'm just going to put the pressure on Donnie and see what he, his reactions and his comments. <laughs> well, I mean, as a... Uh, as, a, as, a, okay. as a business coach, I'm, I'm sitting here listening and I'm thinking, what are these people, what do they actually do? I mean, we can't uh, hear you very well there. Sorry? We oh, can't hear we're you. We're having a little uh, audio okay. situation. Can you, can you hear me? Us? Now? Better? There. Yeah. Oh, That's better. Wow. Okay. <laughs> okay. Perfect. No, I'm sitting here thinking uh, to myself, what are, what, what are, I mean, like self it. What, what do you actually do? What, what we actually do. Yeah, and how do you actually do it? Well, the, the, the process as such is you, we take a saliva sample from our customer, it's sent to the lab, and we analyze a number of SNPs that have been scientifically proven to relate to diet and training and the personality. Then we combine that into a report saying that we can look at muscle type, uh, how you metabolize certain types of food, uh, vitamin needs, uh, are you an, an endurance person or a yeah. power I mean, I, person? I get that, but okay, but then I, then I, and then you send back some kind of, do you have any comments on, on the whole 23andMe um, uh, issues that was in the, the US press last year? Well, there's, there's been quite a few, but one of them is, I guess, what you're aiming at is them giving dietary advice based on non-proven science and that not being health-related, and it was governed by the FDA, I guess. 
Uh, I've seen quite a lot of examples, not just 23andMe, but other DNA related companies as well, giving too specific, too specific advice based on DNA alone. I mean, DNA is part of who we are, but it's not everything. So I think it's kind of dangerous to give too specific advice based on DNA on its own. And I guess that's part of the point we're making here is that you need more than just one single set of data. Yeah. Please um, carry on. I think, uh, if I can uh, interrupt you, um, as uh, Elizabeth just told me, I use a lot of technology to uh, monitor my disease. As I, I was just listening to how Leslie was talking about the, the uh, quality of, of uh, data that you're getting and the measurements, uh, the reliability of that. In order for me to make decisions on whether or not I should take insulin, whether or not I should take dextrose to, to raise my blood sugar level with that. I depend a lot on, on this little piece of device. And honestly speaking, I don't trust this at all. Because this thing has told me this morning that I was in a hyperglycemic coma, according to that thing, and I was standing next to my bed, just doing my thing. So for some reason, this device claimed that my blood sugar was so low that it was actually incapable of functioning my normal activity, functioning normally in this case. So um, I was also discussing that with, with Elizabeth in here just now, uh, that when you're looking at regulations of, of European uh, uh, Commission and European uh, regulations, um, you can see that there is a certain error rate where, where these devices can, uh, can comply to, or how should I explain it? I think comply to, right? Mm. Um, when the data is being told, or when the data manufacturers are being told by the European Commission, okay, your error rate can be 20%, mm. um, how can you even tell to your patients that you have to rely on the data that you're producing yourself, while even the devices that you're using this device uh, is constantly fighting with my pricking device mm. that I measure my blood glucose with directly. Yeah. And when this device says I am 2.1, yeah. my blood glucose meter that I use a drip of blood with can tell me that I'm 5.6, 5.7. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this one can tell me to take dextrose, while the other one tells yeah, me yeah, yeah, don't do yeah. anything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You can, uh, come, you can come yeah. and work with us if you like. That's yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what we do every day. To, yeah, yeah. To, uh, I mean, this is an absolutely key area with yeah. all these devices being available. I mean, one thing people will naturally do is exactly what you're doing and say, well, I'll buy this one and buy this one and try. Especially if it's critical to your lifestyle or your health. You're exactly. going to compare these devices and you're going to have to, we're going to have to understand what, uh, what, what these error limitations are and, and some of its language. I mean, some of it is bridging the language gap between the scientist, the user, the, the health professional, um, the metrologist and the statistician. You know, you, you, yeah. I mean, how many people think, you know, what, the, what is the error in a meter? Uh, I mean, right. you're, you're putting it up for us yes. and telling us. There's, there's a lot of communication about what, what, are the and what are the decisions you're making based on this measurement. And, of course, the regulators are saying, well, these errors may look large, but the decisions you're making shouldn't be affected, although you've given us a good case where maybe your decision is affected. But, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, so yeah, we put we, numbers on the risk. This is a challenge. We, we have to it? translate those uncertainties into risks yeah. uh, and then make an objective decision. Uh, can we accept that level of risk? And how do we communicate that? Yeah, and, yeah. and Dani and me, were having, a say, we're, we're having a discussion. I think Dani would uh, <laughs> go a little bit further on that. Um, which, which one do you mean? Uh, yeah, <laughs> we had a lot of discussion. W well, last year we were talking about using data. Yeah, I mean, lo last year we were saying, everybody was saying, you know, give the user the data. And, and um, well, one half was saying, give the user the data. And now you're saying the consumer demands more. And I, and I argue and say, no, they're not. The consumer isn't demanding anymore. It's the systems that need to be redesigned because they're not they're not efficient enough because we're, they're falling apart and they're too expensive and we need to redesign healthcare. But the consumer isn't saying, oh, I wish I had a Fitbit that could do so much more for me. They don't even know what to do with the data they get today. Yeah. And, I mean, and so I, I, I will argue that the consumer is not demanding, I mean, they're buying more and more, Fitbit is selling more and more expensive devices that says it can measure more and more things. But the only thing people are doing, they're buying more and more expensive pedometers that count steps more, yeah. more 
expensively because they don't use them for anything else. Right. So I'm, I will argue that the consumer themselves aren't demanding so much more data no. uh, because they don't know what to do with it. And even if we gave the consumer all the rights and all the responsibility for the medical data, they don't want it because that's, I mean, if they, then they would become doctors themselves. I mean, they want to pay doctors to look after them for them. It's like you go to a personal trainer to train you in the gym because you don't want to do it yourself. So, I mean, it's, you can't just say, oh, it's the consumer, it's the consumer that wants everything and they want, and, the, and that, that they will control everything. I think there has to be a, a balance between what the consumer wants and what the regulation says, and, and it has to be some kind of a balance. Then where you draw the line, I have no idea. I mean, that's, that's the hard part. Where do you draw the line between how much we regulate and how much we actually innovate? Because mm. sometimes they are opposing. So, I mean, now that's a really interesting sort of, I, I think is a interesting discussion to have. I know that SP, you were talking about being able to sit down and, and talk about things like that. Uh, I mean, I have a very, very good example of, of when people get, you know, like your glucose data thing. Yeah. I, I, was at the, I went to the doctor and she, she, she put me on the scales and she measured my length and, just, and she looked at me. And I, I looked like I look today. And she said, I'm sorry, Donnie, but you are, you are unhealthily obese. <laughs> and I said, I am? He said, yes, this chart says you're, you're in danger of dying any minute because you're so fat you can hardly walk. <laughs> I said, oh, I didn't, never knew I was that fat because <laughs> I, I weigh as much. And she just did the BMI thing, you know. So yeah. staring yourself blind on data is, well, is dangerous as well. I, I, I have to agree with you on that, and I will keep it short. Uh, but I have another example of, uh, of something that uh, Stefan was talking about that, using patient data. We, we've how, just got one minute left. So. Yeah, sure, I will sum it up. Uh, <laughs> how can you rely on patient data if patients are not willing to be completely honest about their data? For instance, uh, well, I have 28 years of diabetes experience. I've met a lot of people with diabetes as well. One of my my best friend actually lost a kidney because he lied on paper about his glucose values. He was so afraid of saying his doctor that he was constantly having high blood sugars that he just wrote down blood glucose values that were not mm. the ones that he actually had. They were using them in the system. They were treating him based on these values. Mm. His hemoglobin values showed, well, it, it must be somewhere in that range. And he lost the kidney because of the fact that they were relying too much on the data that the patient was producing. So my idea is you shouldn't focus too much and you shouldn't put too much reliability in patient data, but you should also find a way to include it in your treatment, but not fully trust it. I, I know this discussion will continue now. I, yes. mean, I know we're going towards the break, uh, Anthony. Yeah, yeah, we better, I think we better move on. And uh, you've raised a, a lot of interesting points there. And uh, I'm conscious that I should be wrapping up at this point. Uh, and I, I mean, I, I think that we have to make a lot more progress uh, on this. And I, I'm not sure it's just a simple balance between using or not using patient data. I think it's about how we use it, how we control it, how we uh, put some rigor into the input of the patient data. And also, I think you've raised another issue about, uh, and it's a diabetes uh, example, is uh, consumer support. Um, you can't just put these devices out there. You've got to help people use them. And I, it's a lesson we learned very early with the uh, diabetes uh, monitors that I worked on in the 80s so that now everybody uses where you had to provide that telephone support to uh, uh, help people with any issues they had. But I think we need to wrap up now. Yeah, but I mean, the, the discussion, I don't know, am I on sound? I mean, the discussion will continue because we're going Absolutely. towards a break. We will move into the cage as well, Lovely. with an in in-depth interview. So please continue the discussion uh, in the cage. And if you want to listen to it, listen, it'll be on the big screen. And for the rest of us, it's a, a coffee break until, uh, is it 2.30? Let's say it's 2.30. Okay, and thank you, everybody, and thank you, all <laughs> members of the panel. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs>